Hey there, friends. Jeff Fritz here, and I am thrilled to be talking about the Azure Developers.NET Aspire Day, about Aspireify, building and deploying with .NET Aspire on Azure. This is th this is a website. This is a project that I've been tinkering with and building since about April, where we wanted to build a, a little website, a news hub that kept up to date with all the latest stuff that's going on with .NET Aspire, right? When you see code samples, announcements, videos, podcasts that either Microsoft folks or folks in the community are writing and producing, we wanted to be able to cover it and present that information in a unified way on a on a news website kind of thing. So we we built uh, the website Aspirify.net, and there's what it looks like right there. You can take a look and and browse through it. Um, go ahead to Aspire ify.net and you'll see the current version of the site i grabbed a screenshot just for this presentation but it's it's got a collection of different things broken down into tutorials and sample code videos and podcasts and announcements you can find all there and there's a great search functionality that you can use to go find maybe some of the topics some of the techniques that you might be looking for to help you do more with dotnet aspire but the key thing that was so important for, for us when, when I was building this website was I wanted it to be a website that was built with .NET Aspire about .NET Aspire. And what that does then is it drives me to start to learn and figure out how to do things correctly and in, in a real way that is supporting a live website, right? I want to be able to make changes, compile, check it into source code, do my continuous integration process, and finally deploy it out to the Aspirify.net website and location out there on the big Microsoft Azure cloud. So I went through and I learned those processes and we built those tools and techniques. Now, that meant I also got to explore and use a couple other Azure services along the way and integrating features that were appropriate in order to make this a complete website. So I added things like Azure storage. I use Azure tables to store information about the various articles that have been identified. I use Azure blobs to store thumbnails from those articles so that I have something nice to present when you navigate to the website. And I use Azure queues for communicating the arrival of new articles so that it knows to go generate a thumbnail and, and archive some information to present on the website. I built a service using the worker service template that would resize images. It's a little container app that just looks for new, um, new entries on an Azure queue and then resizes those thumbnails appropriately and saves them in Azure blobs. I also use Azure AI search. I mentioned you can search for articles on the website and why not just use Azure AI search? There's a couple of indexes that are real easy to set up and configure so that it will read and um, automatically rebuild its index as I create new entries in my table of uh, articles out there. And finally, I use, of course, Azure Cache for Redis. This is, this is the service that's available on Azure. It runs Redis for you. So why not use that to, to output cache the articles, the web interface, as it gets updated, as new content arrives, so that we're not generating new HTML on every request, right? Let's reduce, let's drive down the amount of work that that website is going to be doing. And if there's already content that's been built for a request, fetch it from the cache and present it immediately. This way we can, we can conserve how much process, how much processor our web server uses and be able to handle a, a spike in traffic very, very easily. So let's take a quick look at some of the interesting bits of the source code for Aspirify.net and discuss some of the some of the bits that we've created around our app host model and uh, take a look at a couple of the other things that are floating in there that you might find interesting. So a couple things that I set up and use in my Aspirify's .NET uh, website's app host project, right? Here's my program CS for that, where we go and configure 
all the things that e exist in the system that makes up the website, I set up, of course, my output cache using the add Redis statement here. However, as you can see on line 20, I publish it as a connection string out to Azure. And this is because, well, quite frankly, I'm cheap. So here's the deal. I already have an Azure Redis service out there running and, and it stores and manages content for my blog. So it's already caching content for that and it's not using a lot of space. So let's just share and use it here also. And then I'm, I'm serving two websites with one Redis cache. The alternative here might be to publish the Redis uh, capabilities as a container. You can also specify to publish as uh, Azure Redis. This is just fine for me to publish and reuse an existing service. Additionally, I use Azure Storage, and I, I mentioned that earlier. So here's where I configure the storage capabilities, and you can see I add Azure Storage, and I call it Storage. But I set up some properties on that. I, I tell it to use a SKU that is standard LRS. That's local redundant storage. By default, um, .NET Aspire and the AZD tools will deploy and use a, a more robust storage mechanism and, and SKU out there. Well, I don't need quite that much redundancy for this website. I can get away with just local redundant storage. So I chose the less expensive, and, and less fault tolerant version of Azure storage to keep here. Now, uh, that's some risk that I can take with this website. If for some reason that storage isn't available for a little bit, that's okay, it'll come back eventually and we'll be all right. I also tell it to run the uh, storage locally as an emulator and I specify with data volume so it saves my local storage instance when we're running and debugging locally, um, save that to disk and I also specify use the latest version of the Azure storage emulator. This way there's no concerns with mismatching APIs as we're using the latest tools. And finally, I wanna make sure that I call out here, I use a container that I named Storage Explorer that um, is made available by this person, Seba Gomez on GitHub. And it's called the Azure Storage Explorer. This is really neat, all right, check this out. This is a Blazor-based application that serves as a storage explorer so that I can browse around inside of my blobs, tables, and queues out there um, inside the storage emulator. Because when the Azure storage emulator runs as part of .NET Aspire, it'll be deployed and have random IP uh, ports assigned to it. Well, that makes it a little bit tricky to hook up the storage explorer tool. But with this tool, I'm able to point and say, here's the storage connection string and pass in a connection string reference to the blobs and it will find it and make sure that it connects to it directly and i'll be able to have an extra line available inside my azure dash my inside my dotnet aspire dashboard that has this storage explorer and if i want to browse and look at what's in my local instance i can just click through it there and investigate um and here's a feature that we don't talk too much about. We, I'm using exclude from manifest here. This is a method that will tell the .NET Aspire build when you're getting ready to publish this, don't include this resource as something that's going to be published. It's only here to be used at developer runtime. All right, so when we're building and developing here locally. Really great stuff that makes it easier for me to navigate around and explore my storage. Last thing that I want to show you I'm not a fan of magic strings. So what I did was I created a series of constants here for the various names of things that are saved and placed throughout my application system. This way, when my queue's name changes or if my blob container's name changes, I've got the same constant that I've used throughout the application system to be able to reference and change that later in one place. I don't have to worry about setting up and, and having case sensitivity or misspellings that might happen out there. I've clearly got a constant that I can use as a reference 
and the compiler will help me to ensure that I have the same reference to the names of my queues, the names of my blobs appropriately. All right, let's head back over to the, to the slides and talk a little bit more about how this website system runs. So when I run the application, it comes up and we have a dashboard that looks like this. These are all the services that light up when I develop and run locally. All right, so I took a screenshot here so that I made sure everything was running properly and showed up in, in these slides for us. So you can see right up at the top, there's, there's the blobs, queues, and tables running locally. I have an output cache container that runs locally as Redis. And um, after that, I have a little container that runs that manages a PDF engine so that I can generate reports. Um, and then I've got some database capabilities with Postgres there so that when folks log in, I save their um, associated credentials into a little Postgres database on the side. And I also start up the PG admin service so I can browse into it. Um, next, there's that storage container and then the storage explorer, um, followed by the actual database server. Um, I'm sorry, followed by the actual database that lives inside that database server, conveniently called security. Um, and finally, I've got my C Sharp projects that I've been building, a couple of worker services, my data migration service that migrates and generates um, all of the um, entity framework migrations. It applies those to the database as needed. My thumbnail generation service that I mentioned, a counter service that will do some statistical analysis and report on exactly how much traffic I get. And finally, my website down there at the bottom. So it's a nice collection of services and tools that make up the entire website system, right? It's a system of services and resources that make this up, not just a little website project out there. And this is important. This is something that I think as we think about building applications, we should really consider using .NET Aspire by default for everything because as additional services come online, additional resources that you want to do, it's real easy to add and visualize them on a dashboard like this and to expand your, your system of capabilities using .NET Aspire versus trying to stitch things together after the fact. So very important capabilities and concepts that we need to understand as not just application developers, but system architects. So let me tell you about some of the Azure resources in use. This is the resource group that gets deployed and is running out there for um, Aspireify. This is just about everything except for my Azure search resource and my Redis resource. Those two are shared and they're sitting just outside of this, but these are all the things that are sitting out there, including my own container registry, the couple container apps for those services that were built, a container apps environment that's going to manage all of those containers that are running as part of the application system. Um, a key vault, log analytics workspace, some managed identity. Um, there's my Postgres database, the storage account that contains all of the articles and blobs, the thumbnails that you see. And of course, the website down there at the bottom. Not bad, right? This is, this is a pretty clear system and some things in there that you might not have expected that are part of your application system that you'll end up deploying at some point when you use all the features of .NET Aspire. Now, I had a lot of traffic come through the website a little bit, little bit earlier last week. And quite frankly, things like the Redis cache and, and the output caching strategies we've had, we have out there made sure that things just ran smoothly. Look at this. Averaging about six micro cores over the last week or so here, no problems asked. It, it's just running smoothly. It responds quickly. And I don't have to worry about any kind of spike in processor or memory utilization because it's just chugging along and doing its thing very quickly, getting articles, showing them, and then serving from cache. Now, everything that you hear about, about .NET Aspire and when we talk about deploying things, one of the best ways that we have for you to deploy your Aspire application to Azure is AZD. Now, AZD is the tool for getting your application system prepared and deployed to Azure. 
we, there's other tools out there that will help you get into Kubernetes, help you get onto AWS. But this is the tool that I use to deploy Aspirify.net to Azure. And it's real easy to use. There's just a, a few commands that you need to know in order to get your application running. AZD init, you run that at the command line and it will initialize your application system, set up a couple of configuration files after it looks at all the things that your Aspire app host has declared. AZD pipeline config will set up either GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps pipelines so that it can actually, you know, build and deploy using one of those services. It'll also ask you for any input parameters that you need to provide that are secrets or things that you've declared that need to be added in, keyed in by hand. And finally, AZD up. Uh, just take this thing and push it up, deploy it, send it out to the cloud and, and let the magic happen at that point, right? Now, this is, this is of course, the way you do it with Azure. It, you can still build and deploy with, with your favorite tools and scripts and GitHub Actions that you're using right now, but using AZD really streamlines these things, okay? It's not a requirement, but makes it a whole lot easier to do. But Aspirify.net isn't just that simple. <laughs> it's actually a little bit more complex because we do have some things in there that are a little bit different. So what I had to do for a couple of things here, I had to actually uh, hit the hit hit the escape button, right? This is this is our way to jump in and add extra configuration that .NET Aspire doesn't have for us natively. And that's the AZD infra synth command. So this command will generate a series of scripts, bicep scripts on disk that you can, you can tinker with and adapt to meet your needs. Now, each time that I go and change the, the architecture, right? If I change the topology of my application in code, I'll need to regenerate this file. That's okay because I have it in under source control and I can compare and, and apply my customizations um, easily every time I need to make an update. So you can see here, I made a couple changes to the default ingress capabilities. Um, I added sticky sessions. I wanted to make sure that session affinity between containers was maintained because I'm using a little bit of Blazor Interactive Server. So I wanted to make sure that I stayed um, pinned to the container that I was working with. I also added my custom domains there. Right now, this isn't something that's easy to do with AZD or in our C Sharp code for uh, the app host uh, project, right? So I have custom domains set up there that will automatically deploy and, and update the Aspirify.net and www.aspirify.net domain names. Makes sense. They're declared there, it knows how to allocate them, and it will allocate them appropriately to the Azure Container app that hosts the website. Additionally, we had to customize the GitHub Actions a little bit. So I do a few other things when the website builds, right? Among them, I, I capture the GitHub SHA, the Git SHA, right? That hash that uniquely identifies what was built. This way, when somebody sends me a screenshot of something, or if I want to check which version is currently develop, uh, deployed and running, I, I have the SHA, the current version out there. It's embedded in the footer, and you can see the, a snapshot of the footer from when I wrote these slides a couple days ago. You can see a snapshot of the footer down there, and I, I list version hash, okay? If you brow browse to the website right now, you probably see a different version hash there on the bottom. I also report the current .NET version that it's running under, the current Aspire version, and when the page was last rendered. And capturing and identifying the most recent Aspire version is right there at the top of my GitHub action. I have a little project that just browses through the current, um, the current versions of the Aspire packages and grabs that version and reports it uh, inside of a file so that we can analyze and report that on screen there. I also have unit tests. Darn it, who, who doesn't run unit tests as part of their project? Well, I do, and I wanted to make sure that my unit tests ran and got reported before anything was deployed out to Azure. So I added these two sections that you see there, test with .NET 
and then publish test results using this, uh, this action called publish unit test result action. Real easy to, to use. Uh, I encourage you to check that out because it generates a nice little report and will send you emails if the number of unit tests that succeed or fail or the duration that they took changes significantly. Very handy to have that information in to know when there's a, a significant change there so that you can investigate and follow up on exactly what might have happened with your application. Now, some of the things that I've learned since building and deploying with .NET Aspire, I have my app host project set up with sliding versions for all of my integrations that I use with .NET Aspire. So this way, when my tables or blobs or Postgres, when any of these integrations have updates, maybe there's a patch because there's a new version of the underlying um, container, the underlying capabilities. Maybe there's a security patch that it's important for me to receive. I put in sliding version numbers here, 8.star. You see that for most of those packages there, it's important to have that there then so that I can just push a build and it'll automatically grab the latest versions of those integrations and deploy them with the Aspirify.net system out to my production workspace. However, with .NET Aspire 8.2, that app host project, that, that package down there on the last line, it must be hard-coded to 8.2.0. And that's a known issue that the team is fixing for a future release. Additionally, I've learned to, to revisit and enjoy uh, regions. I've got regions in my code for that app host file because it makes it real easy for me to see the different sections of my code that are setting up different resources. By having these all collapsed, I know here's exactly what's being set up in this region. I can go through and find it very quickly instead of having to see this massive file that has all this configuration code for all of these different resources. It's great to have all the resource definition in one location. However, it, it gets, gets to be a lot for my human eyes to be able to consume all at once. So to be able to hide that and reduce the number of concepts that I'm looking at on screen to just those things that help to facilitate my database migration service or my security database and just look at that one block makes it a lot easier for me to consume and work with my application system. I got to tell you about Azure AI Search. I was pleasantly surprised at how much I was able to get out of this service and integrate it with .NET Aspire. So Azure AI Search is available for you out there. There's a free instance that will support an indexes up to 50 megabytes in storage. That sounds like not a lot, but here's the thing. Dot, uh, Aspirify.net has about 220, 230 articles right now. And each one of those has a paragraph or two um, description that you can search. So I put all of that content into my search index and it only takes up 320K. 320K. So I've got plenty of room to expand and grow before I'm going to start seeing any kind of pressure on need to upgrade from the free SKU here. Additionally, configuring Azure AI Search was real easy to do inside of my app host program, but really all it's doing is passing along an app ID and an API key. It was actually a little bit easier to pass those along as parameters into my web application. You can use the Azure AI Search integration, but you get the exact same features if you just pass in the API key. The monitoring that takes place to give you the tracing and logging with open telemetry works the exact same way whether you're using the Azure AI uh, library directly in your application or if you're using the integration. So I don't really feel committed to using it just yet. I think there's new features that the team needs to bring forward before we start looking at and saying, yes, I want to use that integration inside my system. But you can still use the exact same way you code against Azure AI Search today. I want to make sure that you know that when it builds containers, when AZD builds containers, when that AZD up command is executed, it's going to put them in your registry for you. 
and you're going to get a lot of containers in your registry. Here's a snapshot of my registry that I took a couple days ago. And there's a lot of instances and copies of this same container out there. Going back as, as early as August 13th, you can see on here, right? And, and we're here in the middle of September. That's a lot of extra containers that it's not using. While it's nice to have them out there and I can roll back and choose a different version, realistically, I'm not going to go back to a previous version before two or three versions ago. So I encourage you to check out. There's a PowerShell script that's available out there on Microsoft Learn. Check that out, download it, and it will help you prune this collection of containers that is generated and stored inside of your container registry. There's even some folks that have that uh, PowerShell script run once a week, run once a day, depending on how frequently you're deploying these. What you need to remember is that you get 10 gig of storage by default in that Azure container registry. And if you run out of space, it won't deploy anymore. You'll just get errors in your script, okay? So make sure that you maintain and clean out some of these older container images out here. I do it once every couple of weeks because I don't deploy very frequently and I don't deploy many containers. So, so it's about time for me to go through and, and run that script again and clean up over here. All right, that'll help extend the duration that you're able to use that same initial skew of Azure Container Registry. All right. That's all I have about Aspirify.net. Some of the lessons that I've learned and how we build and deploy that. Real easy to do. I can't share any of the source code for the website, but i um, happy to publish and share some of those screenshots for you so you can see some of the source code modifications that were important for me to make in order to get the application deployed. It's an amazing event today. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to talk about our website. I want to make sure you catch up with all the resources from the event. Check it out at aka.ms, azuredevelopers.net aspire day slash collection, or take a picture of that QR code. It's going to take you to the same place and you'll be able to catch all the resources right there on your, on your device. All right. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Jeff Fritz. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day.